Hi guys, and welcome to this video about A Satirical Elegy by Jonathan Swift. This is one of the seven poems in the comedy anthology for A-level English Literature, Spec B. Um, I am doing a video for all seven poems, so if there is another poem of the seven that you need help with, then look in the A-level poetry playlist and you'll find them. Um, this could be part of the first year of the course, it could be part of the second year of the course, uh, it depends on how your course is taught, but if those of you doing comedy, this might be a selection of poems that you might be studying. So the structure for this video is the same as all of the poem videos. Um, I'm going to go through the poem and analyse it AO2 with some of the key meanings and techniques. I'll start by looking at AO1, which are the key literary concepts and terms um, which are useful in using with this poem. I'll then go on to AO3, which is the social and historical context for this poem. Um, and then finally, to finish off this video for AO4 is, as, as, as is always the case with A-level, uh, we don't just need to know the text really well, but we also need to know the tradition of um, the genre um, that they come from. And for this, obviously, that is the genre of comedy, the tradition of comedy. So we'll link the poem to the comedic genre at the end for AO4. So for AO1, uh, using the terms in bold here will get you AO1. And then if you were going to use these terms to discuss the meanings and the effects of these, then that would get you AO2. So these terms can hit two assessment objectives. This poem, the full title uh, is a satirical elegy, the death of a late famous general, but I'm just going to call it a satirical elegy for short. Uh, but it has that word satire in the title. So one of the things that we need to be calling this poem is an example of a juvenalian satire, which is a type of satire which is very bitter, sarcastic and quite scornful. And it aims to mock and ridicule particular individuals, particularly individuals that could be seen as quite incompetent or were not befitting the power and prestige that they had. And that's the case here um, in this poem. So calling this a juvenalian satire would be very useful. The poem, for the most part, is written in iambic tetrameter, um, which is a poem or, of, or a line of verse that has eight syllables per line, four of which are stressed and four of which are unstressed. And that gives it, along with the rhyming couplets there, a very harsh sounding, quite monotonous, bitter rhythm. So you could tie those terms for prosody into the, um, the meanings of, these, of this poem. The poem could also be said to be didactic because it has a moral lesson at the end. It teaches us something about pride and vanity and what happens to us if you're not careful, if you don't use your honour and your pride and your power well. So the poem does end with a slightly didactic finish. Another term that's in the title is elegy. And um, elegy is often a poem that's written which is designed to mourn or celebrate the life of somebody um, in a compassionate way. They're often read out, for example, at funeral um, celebrations or, or funeral services. Uh, a eulogy, by the way, is the prose version. So elegy is the verse version. Um, and what we expect then from the title of this poem is a, quite a sombre, compassionate poem about the death of a person. However, that doesn't make sense because obviously this is a comedy spec. So it's not necessarily the type of elegy that we expect. Uh, and in fact, Swift is kind of mocking the elegy form as well as the Duke in this poem. The final term that you could use is an Italian word, which is volta. And if you look at line 25 of the, um, of the poem, it's slightly indented to show you that volta. Volta means a turn, really, or, or a shift in argument. So in this poem, the speaker turns from talking to somebody on the street to talking directly to the reader. And that is an example of a volta. And it's after line 25, where we get that didactic teaching coming through about pride and vanity. So those terms in bold are quite useful for AO1. The meanings of those terms, the effects of those terms would get you as well AO2. For AO3, we obviously as well need to use our knowledge of the social and historical context in order to complement our analysis. Because again, like we're saying this to students this week, the, the AO3 AO is not designed to overtake your um, analysis because it would start to sound a bit like a history essay. 
it's there to complement your analysis. So it's there to help you come to some kind of interpretations for AO5. So the poem is about uh, the first Duke of Marlborough, who was known as General John Churchill. And the poem was written in 1722 and published in 1765. So there was quite a gap between when this poem was first written, when the Duke died, and when it was uh, published. Um, so Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill, is the target of Swift's satire in this poem. Um, to quote Arthur Appleby, who is a, I suppose, a literary critic, he says that Jubilalian satire provokes a darker kind of laughter. It is often bitter and criticises corruption or incompetence with scorn and outrage. Patricia Green also says that while Horatian satire attempts to teach, Juvenalian satire punishes, and Horatian satire really is the opposite of Juvenalian. Ju Horatian is much more lighter, much more kind of innocent in its comedy, much more hidden motives, whereas the Juvenalian satire is much more explicit in who it is critiquing and what it is really saying and what its issue is. Um, Appleby also says that the 18th century was dominated by satiric poetry, prose and drama, Satirists, or as guardians of the culture, sought to protect their highly developed civilization from corruption by attacking hypocrisy, arrogance, greed, vanity and stupidity. So that's also quite a useful quote to sum up, really, what Swift is also doing um, with this poem. Again, I think a misconception in the past at A-level has been that students need to quote other people, as in critics. And that's certainly one way of getting AO5. But you don't have to. And I, I think I made the mistake early on with this new spec of doing so. And what I quickly found is that it's very difficult to obviously learn the quotes in the first place. And it just is another burden, really. So you don't have to quote from other people if you don't want to. We still have an example of a satire uh, now called Private Eye magazine. Uh, and that continues the tradition of satire that Swift, you know, was using here um, three, or, three or 400 years ago. Uh, if you look at Private Eye, Private Eye is very much like a comic uh, and it has lots of comic strips and it has lots of speech bubbles coming from notable people's mouths like celebrities, royalty, politicians and so on as a way to mock them. Um, if a politician has uh, done something wrong, then chances are they will be mocked in Private Eye for that incompetence or whatever it is that they have done wrong. So we still have a tradition of satire called Private Eye really knocking the powerful down a peg or two and making them seem less invincible. Because after all, at the end of the day, no matter how much money we have, no matter what our heritage is, we're all still human. Um, so Private Eye would be something to refer to for AO3 as well as, a, as, a, as an example of a modern satire. Um, Swift was one of the Duke's political enemies. Um, we don't really need to go into too much detail about this because the, the history is quite dense. And again, remember, this is a literature course, not a history one. So we don't really need to worry too much about why that is. Um, but it is the case that they were almost political rivals. Um, and satire itself is very, very old. It comes from Greek and Roman poets. Um, so, you know, a very um, long time ago now. Um, and same as today, really, those satires were written to reform social evils and injustices, mock human foibles or shortcomings and errors, and, and potentially as well to bring about some kind of change. Um, the idea that if you shed light on something, you avoid falling into the same pitfalls afterwards because you will know what to avoid. So satire can also as well be, be about bringing about change and avoiding it happening again. So there's quite a lot of AO3 for this poem, as you might expect, simply because it is probably the only political poem in the whole collection of the seven. And it kind of stands aside to the others, which are slightly more about domestic relationships like Mrs. Sisyphus or like the flea um, or like not my best side or my rival's house, for example. So this poem tends to be kind of an outcast. It's the only really political one. I'll give you some examples of some satire. Satire is everywhere. It's on social media. It's in the press. Um, it's in the news. Um, so on the right there, we have a front cover of Private Eye from a few years ago now. And obviously, you can see the speech bubble there coming from Trump's um, mouth, which is it's a no brainer. The joke being, obviously, that he wasn't uh, he's being perceived as not very intelligent. So um, that is an example of Private Eye mocking the powerful and the elite for their shortcomings, sometimes often caricatures as well does the same. But also social media, there's satires whenever a politician is mocked or a celebrity is mocked. 
it's also an example of satirical writing. So a few years ago, Kylie Jenner, for example, posted this, I think, on Twitter. Um, Kylie, or somebody did. Kylie Jenner is the aerial we all deserved. And then Bill Nye underneath said there's already enough plastic in the ocean. And obviously that's rooted in real. It's rooted in real issues like um, plastic pollution. But it was a way of creating, I suppose, cheap laughs and mocking um, Kylie Jenner there. So satire is everywhere. Really, whenever you're mocking politicians or current affairs, you are indulging in satire. And programmes like Have I Got News For You, Mock The Week, which take, and also lots of material from comedians as well, take a lot of their material from real life and current affairs and, you know, news stories. So that's all satire. So satire really is a cornerstone of the comedic tradition. So it's no wonder that AQA have put a satire as a poem um, in this collection of seven. So let's then start to analyse the poem for AO2. And it's one continuous stanza, it's one continuous block of text. So I've kind of um, broken it down to make it more easier to annotate, I suppose. But the speaker is not Swift. The speaker is a different character that Swift has created in order to bring about, um, you know, Swift's desires and his intentions, which is to really mock um, this Duke character. So the speaker begins by saying, his grace, impossible, what dead, of old age too, and in his bed, and could that mighty warrior fall, and so inglorious after all? Well, since he's gone, no matter how, the last loud trump must wake him now, and trust me, as the noise grows stronger, he'd wish to sleep a little longer. So, as is always the case with particularly literature at A-level, it's not a case of filling your essay with lots of terminology for poetry. We don't need to worry about every single question mark, every single comma, every single adjective. We don't need to do that. But AO2 or AO1 even, the methods are there to support your interpretation because AQA have always said that it's AO5 that kind of leads the way um, with um with, with this specification. So your terminology should always be relevant to comedy or the question. It shouldn't just be generic analysis, feature spotting, because that's not actually what is required here. So, but we do have some exclamatives here. We've got the yellow there, three lines of exclamatives, um, which could convey the speaker's surprise, his jubilation, but also a sense of mock sadness and sarcasm and also satisfaction upon hearing the fact that this duke has died. Um, the, the poem begins in media's res, which means it kind of begins in the middle of something. It begins in, a, in an existing conversation. And the speaker, through these exclamatives, has a very theatrical tone. He seems to be relishing mocking the duke's importance and, and the duke's death and the perceived honour, allegedly, that he had. The irony, obviously, by using that adjective mighty and also capitalising it, is to say that actually the Duke didn't die heroically on a battlefield like a warrior. He actually died peacefully in his bed in comfort and in luxury. So he did. He died in luxury, not in sacrifice like soldiers, for example. So he's not really a mighty warrior at all. So the speaker is from line three already starting to mock the, um, the Duke's sense of importance and glory. Um, and that's why it was so inglorious, because he died in bed, not in the battlefield. So, again, there's that disparity between the soldiers dying on a battlefield and and how the Duke died in relative comfort. The last loud trump has a biblical connotation to it. The idea that it is a Christian belief that trumpets would wake the dead upon their final judgment, uh, whether determining whether they would go to heaven or hell. And clearly by that last line, he'd wish to sleep a little longer, suggests that the speaker believes that the Duke will be going to hell and suffer eternal damnation rather than heaven. And that's why the speaker says the Duke should have, you know, cherished peaceful sleep more before his final judgment at the gates of heaven. As we move down, and could he be indeed so old as by the newspapers were told? Three score, I think, is pretty high. "'Twas time in conscience he should die. "'This world he cumbered long enough. "'He burnt his candle to the snuff. "'And that's the reason some folks think "'he left behind so great a stink.'" So you can hear the rhyming couplets there and the rhythm as well, uh, really creating this quite monotonous barrage of, of vitriol almost at, at this Duke figure. Three score means 60. So the Duke was 60 years old when he died. And you could interpret this as being quite disrespectful to the dead. You know, this is an old man who has died. 
Um, however, what Swift is saying is or what the speaker is saying is that this Duke earned that disrespect because of his incompetence and the way in which he lived his life and affected other peoples. There is no compassion here. There's no reverence at all. And because the speaker is basically saying it's about time he died. Uh, you could call this poem a vitriolic diatribe and a diatribe is a rant. So the speaker is really indulging in an extended rant about this Duke's alleged honours and how ill suited they were to that Duke because he didn't deserve them from the speaker's opinion. Uh, there's a tone here of, of good riddance, basically. Um, he lived long enough. It was about time he died. The metaphor of the candle is all about living life to the full. So part of the reason why Swift is or why Swift or the speaker is so angry is because while he caused suffering all around, um, he lived in relative luxury and he lived his life to the full, which is symbolised with the candle going right down to the bottom, as if all of the candle was burnt out. So the Duke's life is now extinguished in the same way that you would blow out a flame. Um, he didn't, you know, he didn't die young like soldiers he sent to war. He died in relative luxury um, and lived his life to the full uh, and had a good standard of living. And towards the bottom there, he left behind so great a stink. Again, a metaphor, that stink being the metaphor for the legacy of pain and suffering that was left after he passed away. So even though he's now passed away, the impact, the negative impact of his choices um, will last far beyond his death. So you can tell with this tone of good riddance that this is not a normal elegy. Um, and rather than it being a compassionate depiction of caring, you know, mourning, that is actually very bitter and vitriolic. This, this is not a celebration of somebody's life at all. Uh, so a Swift is not only um, turning the Duke into a satire, but also the, the poetical form as well as also um, satirical too. Um, Hold his funeral appears, nor widow sighs, nor orphan tears, won't at such times each heart to pierce, attend the progress of his hearse. But what of that, his friends may say, he had those honours in his day, true to his profit and his pride, he made them weep before he died. So, again, this is about the Duke's legacy, widows and orphans, because of the Duke's incompetence and, and the choices he made, uh, as being, for example, a war profiteer. Um, the widows or the orphans won't line the streets of the hearse and bow their heads in compassion or mourning or respect because their hearts have not been pierced by grief. They don't care that it's his funeral and they're basically turning a cheek. They, they couldn't care less. So, again, that goes to show how it's not just the speaker who feels angry, but also society more generally. Um, the prophets and his pride means arrogance, vanity and greed. Um, the speaker is saying that the honours that the Duke got when he was living are now meaningless because the Duke has died. Um, and Swift is also saying, or the speaker is also saying, that those honours were, were not fair because they were got for corruption and embezzlement. Um, so it's, it's, they, he didn't even deserve those honours and those medals. Um, and obviously in this poem, the speaker or Swift is using the Duke of Marlborough as the target, of, as the main target of this kind of abuse. Um, but um, it, he is also speaking to people generally who have pride, vanity and greed as well. So it is a message for everyone, really, um, you know, about the same thing, what to avoid. It's a message for anyone who has these profits and prides. And he finishes that section by saying, you know, he caused suffering and damage to speaker, but also Swift is saying that the Duke was not deserving of the genuine elegy format, um, despite being given honours wrongly. So despite having this profit and pride and despite having these medals, he doesn't deserve a proper elegy because he doesn't deserve a proper send off. And then we have the Volta. It's slightly indented on line 25. Come hither, all ye empty things, ye bubbles raised by breath of kings, who float upon the tide of state. Come hither and behold your fate. Let pride be taught by this rebuke, how very mean are things a duke, from all his ill-got honours flung, turned to that dirt from whence he sprung. And that's the end of the poem. So we have the repetition of the imperatives there, come hither. So the speaker turns to the reader more broadly, uh, showing that volta. And this is where the didactic message comes through. And he's saying all the empty things because he's basically saying empty, meaning van vanity uh, and being quite hollow and superficial. So he's talking not just to the Duke, but but to anyone who has vanity and pride. 
uh, bubbles raised by the breath of kings means that the didactic message of this poem is that those in power sometimes are least suited to it. Um, so it's a satire of the political system more broadly. And even today, we all have views about uh, politicians that have been elected to high office, whether in the UK or abroad, and they haven't been the best people for the job. So again, those people tend to be criticised for making bad decisions and affecting people's lives because politicians obviously do have great power. They can, you know, tell the army to invade and, and they, they have the ability to affect people's lives um, quite widely, actually. So it's all about people in power uh, aren't necessarily um, deserving of that power. Uh, float upon tide of state means that the Duke's talents and significance is now hollow or was hollow. Um, he wasn't supposed to be in that position of power because he didn't have the gravitas to, or the, or the kind of determination or the characteristics to make a good job of it. Uh, and, and the speaker in bracket Swift is basically attacking this idea of preferment and elitism instead of a notion of a meritocracy. So rather than qualifications and actual, uh, you know, positives of somebody's um, um, work life to give them a particular role, it's all about elitism and preferment. So people that, for example, are anti-monarchy, one of the reasons why they don't like the monarchy is because they don't like it being, um, you know, um, kind of like a, a constant bloodline um, line of, of people. Um, so that could be one of the reasons why uh, hereditary, I suppose, is what I'm looking for, reason why people might not like the monarchy. The monarchy as well had great wealth, great power, but that's one of the reasons why sometimes people don't like them um, or the monarchy generally or the institution of monarchy. Um, and then he says, um, you know, let pride be taught by this rebuke, how very mean a things a duke. So he's using this duke as an example and saying that, you know, these lines seem to be written like an epitaph that you might find on a gravestone, for example. But actually, as we know, rather than being compassionate and sad, they're quite bitter and provocative. Mean here means kind of petty and insignificant. So you know, he's basically reducing right down this Duke's um, status as being unimportant and being actually quite trivial and, and um, quite, you know, unnecessary. Um, again, the, the speaker really does enhance the idea of the speaker not really being deserving of these honours. Um, Ill-got, because, you know, in, ideally, incompetent people are not supposed to get power. They're not supposed to get medals or rewards. So Swift and the speaker is kind of resenting the untouchable nature of the elite um, who are, you know, who are synonymous with greed and wealth and honours. Just because they have those things doesn't mean they deserve them or doesn't mean they're justified to have those things. So that's what um, Swift is, is saying. And the final line of the poem, turned to dirt from whence he sprung. Again, this idea that despite the Duke's success, allegedly, when he was alive and his wealth and his honours and his influence in you know, his area, let's say, uh, he has returned to dirt and that's meaningless. So obviously the connotations of dirt being, having no value, being quite trivial. And you could also say there's some irony there because obviously the speaker is saying that the, the, the Duke's honours came from embezzlement and corruption, which are unclean things. So ironically, um, the Duke has been working with dirt even when he was alive. So it's no surprise that he's returned back to it now after death and his final judgment. So that's the poem and those are some really important kind of meanings there and some important um, devices as well. So to link to AO4 then we've now got to take this poem and link it to comedy. What aspect of comedy can this poem be linked to? Well death is a taboo and sometimes in, um, in comedy uh, comedies will look at taboos and as a way of challenging them. And also funerals are supposed to be very formal. You know, the Victorians, after this poem was written, obviously, but the Victorians were well known for having very strict etiquette about mourning and, and being seen to be mourning, for example, wearing black. So death and funerals, it's very formal usually. But in this poem, obviously, that formality is being subverted or inverted and being turned into a something to be laughed at, turned into a something to, to satirise, turned into something to, to be to take humour from. So it's the breaking of formality. You could say that the Duke is the comic villain um, in this poem, and comic villains often feature in comedies. Um, you could say that the speaker is clearly mocking human weakness, so the arrogance, the pride, the vanity of the, of the um, general, 
of being somebody that didn't deserve that. So comedies will often mock human weakness and, and shortcomings, shortfalls. Um, dysfunctional relationships here, you could say the dysfunctional relationship between the speaker and the duke or Swift and the duke or the duke and society more generally. The speaker's very outspoken, you know, he's pretty much engaged in this constant uh, monotonous rant of this of this duke. There's sarcasm, there's irony, for example, in the title as well. There's mocking as well. And obviously this is a satire. And like I said at the beginning, satires are often cornerstones of the comedic tradition. So it would be really important to, to use that word satire in this. It's obviously in the title to remind you. Okay. Finally, then, why is this poem comedic on a more broad level, maybe for AO5 and AO4? So Swift uses quite a, an aggressive juvenalian satire, full of bitter, unforgiving sarcasm, to really celebrate or rejoice in the general's death. So there is this great conflict in this poem between what we expect an elegy to be and what this elegy is actually turns out to be. So there's this disparity there between what we expect and what we get. So Swift is ironically using this elegy form to lament the general or to mourn him, but actually that's obviously not happening. He's using this elegy to, to say good riddance. So purpose of the satire is to ridicule, potentially to bring about change. And you could say this is a bitter vitriolic diatribe, mocking pride, power, vanity, elitism and preferment, um, which obviously is what the speaker and Swift uh, more widely is, is against. Private Eye is something else to refer to for AO3. We still have the satirical tradition in this country, in the world generally. So this constant need to mock the elite, um, shed light on incompetence um, as a way of kind of knocking them down a peg or two and making them realise that their wealth does not protect them from shortcomings and from that um, scrutiny. Um, so the comedy here is, is being used to, to attack the wealthy, the powerful, the elitism, and to remind people that they are mere mortals, that we are all mere mortals who will leave this earth with nothing, just like when we entered it. So we can't take anything with us, even if you, you know, get great success and great, and that great success causes great hubris or great arrogance in your life. It doesn't matter. You can't take any of it with you. And if you have misused that, that, um, that power, then chances are you are at risk of being, um, you know, shown for that and you have no control, therefore, over your reputation after death. Um, Swift's ability to mock a man who always thought he would have glory and wealth. So, again, the idea that death is the ultimate agent of change of which none of us have control. Um, and how in this poem his death and how mortality generally uh, can be seen as a means of dismissal, no matter who they were, no matter how powerful they were, no matter how rich they were, they can still be dismissed. So those honours all go um, into the bin, really. They, they're all dismissed as trivial and insignificant and meaningless. And you could also link the way the, the comedy to the way the poem is told, this kind of very consistent rhyming couplets, rhyme scheme, AABB, but also the speaker's exclamations at the beginning, the um, iambic tetrameter, constantly giving across this very bitter and very angry tone. So in summary then, this is a, a slightly unusual poem for the collection of the seven. This is really the only political one, but you could use this poem on a number of different levels. You could also use this poem to discuss about flawed characters, flawed men, for example, perhaps anything to do with class, anything to do with wealth, um, but also importantly, anything to do with satire. And this sometimes how comedy can come from the darker side of things by approaching the taboo. Thank you.